Hello and welcome to this video on the adrenal glands. Today we're going to be covering the basic anatomy and physiology of the adrenal glands and I'll be covering clinical disease at the end of the video. Please make sure to look at the workbook that's included in the description as this will help your learning and has some of the illustrations used from the video. So let's start off with the location of the adrenal glands. Well, as the name says, they sit above the kidneys, ad renal, so that's a real easy way to remember where they're located. The left kidney is slightly higher than the right kidney, and this is due to the presence of the liver on the right-hand side of the body. Now let's have a look at the different layers of the adrenal glands. So the first three outer layers of the adrenal glands are known as the cortex, whilst the inside area is known as the medulla. These different areas will secrete different hormones that affect the body in different ways, and I'll come on to discuss these. So the first outer layer of the cortex is known as the zona glomerulosa. The layer after that is called the zona fasciculata, and the final layer of the cortex is known as the zona reticularis. So the zona glomerulosa secretes a mineralocorticoid, and that's known as aldosterone. The zona fasciculata secretes a glucocorticoid known as cortisol. And the zona reticularis secretes androgens or sex hormones. The medulla secretes adrenaline and noradrenaline. An easy way to remember which is which is that the medulla is in the middle of the adrenal glands and the cortex is on the outside of that. Another useful way of remembering what's what in the adrenal glands is to remember the term GFR. So GFR is a way of monitoring kidney function and we can remember that the adrenal glands sit on top of the kidneys. So that's an easy way for us to remember the order of glomerulosa fasciculata reticularis. To remember the different hormones, I like to think that the hormones get sweeter as you go down the layers. So aldosterone is a mineralocorticoid. We then move on to cortisol, which is involved in glucose metabolism. So that's a bit sweeter. And then lastly, we have the androgens, or the sex hormones, which are the sweetest of all three. So the next area I wanted to discuss was negative feedback loops, which are a really important part of endocrinology and the management of hormones in the body. So the first I'm going to talk about is called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Uh, and this is what regulates our aldosterone and has a role in monitoring our blood pressure and fluid levels. So it starts off with a hormone called angiotensinogen, which is released by the liver. This is converted into angiotensin 1 via renin, which is released from the juxtoglomerular cells of the kidney. And this is in response to a low blood pressure. After this, angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2 by angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE. And this is from the lungs. So ACE is a really important enzyme to remember because it is used in a class of drugs called ACE inhibitors, which are used in patients with hypertension. So this essentially stops the conversion of angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Now angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor, which is obviously going to raise our blood pressure. So by stopping the production of angiotensin 2, we can keep blood pressure low. Angiotensin 2 also stimulates the production of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. So aldosterone has a number of different roles, but its main role is in the retention of sodium and water from the renal tubules. It also causes the excretion of potassium, and this helps to maintain our electrolyte and fluid balance. By hanging on to our sodium and water, our blood pressure is going to rise. Our kidneys will then detect this rise in blood pressure, 
and they'll stop releasing renin so our blood pressure remains at a stable level. This is a good example of a negative feedback loop. So the second feedback loop I want to talk about is called the hypothalamic pituitary axis and this is involved in the regulation of cortisol. So it starts off with the hypothalamus in yellow and this releases CRH or corticotropin releasing hormone. This stimulates the synthesis and release of ACTH or adrenocorticotropic hormone from the anterior pituitary gland. This ACTH then stimulates the release of cortisol from the adrenal cortex. So cortisol is a steroid hormone and its main role is in metabolism so it increases our hepatic gluconeogenesis, it increases our lipolysis, it has a role in protein metabolism. Outside of metabolism it also has a role in our stress response and it also has immunosuppressant properties. Whilst we're discussing roles I need to mention about the androgens released from the zona reticularis. So this is in the form of DHEA and this is a relatively small quantity as most of our sex hormones are produced by our sex organs. It doesn't have any effect in men but it is converted into testosterone where it does have some role. The zona medulla releases noradrenaline and adrenaline and these are useful in our fight or flight reflex. So for the final topic of this video I wanted to talk about a clinical disease known as Cushing's disease and essentially this is when there is excess cortisol in the blood. There can be a few causes to this, firstly a pituitary tumour and this is known as Cushing's disease and this is going to cause uh, an increase in the production of ACTH and therefore the increase in cortisol in the blood. A more rarer cause is ectopic ACTH production. So you could have a tumour with paraneoplastic features and that could then cause a secretion of ACTH and thus an increase in cortisol in the blood. The last cause, which is probably the most important one to remember, is steroid use. So the first two are known as endogenous causes, so they're from within the body. But steroid use is an exogenous cause, so we give steroids for many, many diseases and if patients are on too high a dose or on them for too long, they can develop Cushing syndrome. So the features patients get, um, you can think about this funny drawing I've drawn uh, and it's known as a lemon on matchstick. So patients get central obesity with proximal muscle loss, uh, so they've got very thin arms and legs but then quite a big central body. A couple other terms I find useful for remembering is a buffalo hump, so this is when patients get a fat pad on their back, and a moon face, and this is caused by fat redistribution redistrib and fat going to their face. Um, so these aren't terms you'd want to use in front of patients, but are certainly a useful way to remember the consequences of Cushing's. The treatment of Cushing's is obviously dependent on the cause, so if you have a pituitary tumour you might want to resect that or try and treat that, and if you have Cushing's due to steroid use then you'd want to take the patients off steroids um, in a slow and controlled manner. So that's it for the video, hopefully this has been a useful overview of the basic anatomy and physiology of the adrenal glands, a look into some feedback loops and a bit about Cushing's disease. Thank you for listening.